Something not everybody knows about me is that I'm a runner. I like to run. It is my exercise of choice. It keeps my body healthy. It keeps my mind healthy. And I genuinely enjoy doing it. I do it about four to five times a week. However, if someone were to say to me, hey, Brent, how about you run a marathon with me tomorrow? I would not really be prepared to do that. And let's pretend that I do. Let's pretend that I say, yeah, oh, sure, I'll run a marathon with you tomorrow. So I wake up early in the morning and I start running this marathon. What's going to happen? Halfway through, if even halfway through, I'm going to get an injury. My legs are going to break down, not only because I'm not physically prepared, I'm not mentally prepared. And in music, we also need to be mentally and physically prepared to perform at our best ability to have a great performance. So on the show today, I have Michael Lake to talk to us all about warming up your mind and body for killer musical performances that's coming right up. Welcome to the LJS Podcast, where you get weekly jazz tips, interviews, stories, and advice for becoming a better jazz musician. And now your host, he's a jazz musician, author, and entrepreneur, Brent Bartstra. What's up, everybody? Brent here from LearnJazzStandards.com, which is a blog, a podcast, and videos all geared towards helping you become a better jazz musician. Just want to thank you for being here. I really appreciate you. And we do have a special guest on the show today, and that is Michael Lake from Altobone.com. Michael is a trombone player. He's an author. He's a YouTuber, and he's a great educator and performer. So, so excited to have him on to share with us all about warming up the mind and the body for killer musical performances. This is something that we actually haven't talked about in the podcast before. It's a great topic, and Michael really goes over a lot of great, valuable stuff today. Uh, things that we do talk about the physical side of warming up, right? So that you don't injure yourself, so that you know, you're know you able to play to your peak performance physically. But we also talk a little bit about warming up your mind, getting your mind prepared, thinking about things that, quite frankly, I don't normally think about when I'm warming up or thinking about playing my instrument. And so Michael just really lays down a lot of value for us today. So uh, get ready for a great Great talk with Michael Lake. Want to make sure you're subscribed to the show. Make sure you're subscribed on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. We have a lot of great stuff coming up. In uh, in particular, we are about to approach. Uh, we are about to approach Jazz Standards Month. Jazz Standards Month, and you don't want to miss this month. We have a lot of stuff that we're going to be talking about as far as understanding jazz standards, learning jazz standards, getting the most out of them. So make sure you're subscribed. All right, that's enough of that. Without further ado, let's. Jump into my talk with Michael Lake. All right, welcoming on the show today is Michael Lake, who is the trombone player behind Altobone.com. He's an author and a YouTuber. Really excited to have him on. So, hey, Michael, thanks for being here. Hey, Brent. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Really excited to have you on. I learned about you uh, from uh, Rodney Brim, who was recently on the podcast, and uh, was just uh, it was great to connect with you and uh, you know learn more about you and what you do. But for those who don't know about you and who you are, uh, why don't you give like a little quick bio uh, and let us know what's up? Sure. Um, I am a, as Brent said, I'm a trombone player. I happen to play a flavor of trombone that's not very well known, which is alto trombone. But uh, I have uh, played my entire life. I lived in New York for quite a few years playing professionally. I played more salsa probably than jazz when I was in New York with Ray Barreto and Lalo Rodriguez and a whole bunch of the Latin guys. Um, and uh, have kind of evolved into wanting to show people how to be better musicians and how to improvise better. So, uh, you know, I've done a lot of work in writing books and putting YouTube videos together, and I still do perform, and uh, all things trombone and uh, improvisation is kind of my theme. Awesome. And how, how long have you been doing, I know you have altobone.com, how long have you been doing that? Uh, I think it's been about 10 years now. I think I think the momentum has the momentum has ramped up as I've written my books and I've uh, dived into video more and really trying to do some uh, interesting and uh, fun things with video. So I'm I'm kind of uh, it seems like I'm doing more and more every day. But I I think I've been at it about ten years with Altobone.com. 
That's awesome. And you're a fantastic musician. Um, thanks for sharing a little bit about who you are and uh, just excited to pick your brain today. Uh, kind of the context of our conversation today is uh, you uh, had mentioned to me that you had once checked out a video of mine where I talk about a 30 minute practice session. Uh, however, you noted that I only left uh, this 30 minute practice session is uh, something that I suggest for people. You don't have enough time to practice, but you want to practice. So, you know, how should you set up a practice session? Uh, but you noted that, hey, I didn't leave very much time to get warmed up and get ready to go. And for a brass player like you, uh, that's uh, that's just quite not possible. And so that kind of got us talking a little bit about this idea of warming up and what that means for different uh, instruments. I-, I thought we should start off by talking about why is warming up important uh, for us as musicians? Well, I think I, I think it's important because, and, and, and as you and I have talked about, it really kind of depends on the instrument. And that's why I kind of thought it was so funny where, you know, you can pick up your guitar and immediately start playing arpeggios. Right. And yet for a trombone player, it's going to be a little while before I get to arpeggios. You know, so it's, you know, it's going to take uh, getting myself not only physically, but mentally kind of in a space where I can be a musician and, and kind of play what's in side of me and what's needed for me. So it was just kind of, it was, it was an interesting contrast to me between what a guitar player may need in order to get the facility working and what a brass player may need with all the muscles around the mouth and, and the arms and the, and the lungs and all of the stuff working in, in concert to hopefully at some point get to the point where you can start making music. So I just thought it was an interesting uh, contrast. And, uh, you know, the point of warming up is it, it's, it's kind of like, you know, do you want, as soon as you open up your eyes in the morning, do you want to jump out of bed and go for a run? You know, I don't think there are many people that are really going to do that. And I think if you did, I think you can run the risk of, of hurting yourself because you're just, your, your physiology is not yet ready for the strain of doing that activity. And the word strain does come to mind when I talk about trombone playing because, you know, we, we have a lot of muscles that are working in coordination. And, uh, if you don't prepare those, you're not going to have a, a very successful time of it that day. And if you do too too much damage to it, it could be longer lived. So uh, I, I think the importance of, of warming ourselves up is just kind of easing ourselves into this complex process of coordinating our bodies and our minds to create music. Right. And that's a fantastic point. And, uh, you know, I, I will first say that I think that every instrument, no matter what instrument you play uh, in, in the audience right now, it's important to warm up. Uh, it's to some degree. You can injure. Your, uh, we're, t- we're talking a little bit about the physical right now. You can certainly injure yourself, no matter what instrument you play. However, like you're pointing out, an instrument like the trombone requires a lot of physicalness, a lot of, uh, you know, whether it's your entire body or your embouchure, your mouth. There's a lot that goes into that. Maybe a little more than someone like me, who's a guitar player, who um, th- there are things that need to get warmed up, and there are things I need to do to prevent myself from injury but it's it's not as much as a as a trombone player so yeah, that's obviously important so I, I you did mention something about you did mention that warming up the mind and i'm excited to get to that because i i do think that that is a really interesting thing because so far we're talking about a little bit but the physicalness of warming up and avoiding injury of of just being able to play to your full potential physically uh and then there's this other side of warming up your mind where we really get into more of the how do we perform well? Like under if we're going to a gig, how are we going to be in the best condition possible? Uh, so I'm excited to get to that. Let's talk a little bit more about the body, though, warming up the body. Let's talk about brass first, because that's your expertise. What can brass yep. players do to start warming up? What would you suggest? Well, I'll tell you one thing that I do, and I think my bandmates have gotten used to it by now. But when I when I show up for a uh, let's say, call it a regular rehearsal with a band that I play with frequently, I always and I live in Arizona, so I'm able to do this more. I always go outside. I I, I can't just sit in the room and add to the cacophony of everybody warming up and blasting and whatever they're doing. I need to kind of go outside. First of all, I love playing outside because it just opens up my ability to play without the the sound bouncing off the walls and hitting me back. Um, 
but I like to go outside because I can hear myself. And, and part of this is not just knowing that I'm going through, I'm checking off the box of buzzing. You know, I buzzed here and I played high and I played long. It's more than that to me. It's really hearing where I'm at right now, uh, listening to the articulation. Because again, if we kind of contrast this with guitar, you know, the articulation of a guitar or a piano is not nearly as intricate as it is coordinating the muscles of the mouth and the tongue and the lungs and the throat and everything that goes with going ta. So that's part of what I need to hear. How is my articulation? How is my intonation? So I'm going to be listening carefully to, you know, going up the partials of the horn and, and am I in tune? Am I straining? Does, does the tone sound squeezed because last night I played a lot and I haven't really fully recovered from it. So to me, a big part of warming up well is to be able to hear myself and not be part of that, you know, like I said earlier, that mess of sound where everybody's going, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> you know, and I, and, and I think people think it's weird, like I'm being antisocial or something, but I'm not. I'm just be, g- taking myself into a place where I can truly hear myself and where I'm at right now, kind of what I need to know going forward. Yes, I played too much last night and my chops are, are, are tired, so let's start the re- rehearsal easy uh, so I don't blow myself out. So that's kind of my self-diagnosis of being in that space and getting myself warmed up. And to your point about the mind, I think it, I think it's both things. I think it's the physical and just getting myself mentally prepared. Right. Uh, absolutely. So you, you like to go outside, you like to really focus on your sound a lot, which is interesting that you're, that you're talking a lot about your sound and how does everything feel? It's almost like this mindfulness practice uh, that you're connecting yeah. with your instrument, which is which is really cool, really important. It's something that I've been trying to be very conscious of lately uh, as well. Like, how, how does it actually, how am I feeling right now when I'm playing my instrument? Um, is there, you know, why does it feel better now than it did yesterday? Why does it feel worse than it did yesterday? All these things are are kind of important to cue into. So the, so you, you get outside. You're, you're starting to practice. You're starting to to do a few things. You're uh, asking yourself these questions. What are some things that you would suggest for all brass players or even trombone players? What are what is something that you would do uh, ex- like exactly? Well, I think I, there are players who don't do a regular practice routine and they may show up to a gig or a a rehearsal they get their horn out and they blow a few notes and they believe they're ready now maybe they are but maybe the suggestion i would give someone that kind of falls into that routine is if you gave it a little more time to kind of ramp up you might find that your facility for playing gets better. Your flexibility improves. Um, I, I think there's a lot that goes that, that can be beneficial to just preparing yourself well. I remember I was at the International Trombone Festival a couple of years ago, and I was listening to Ed Neumeister, who played with the Than Jones Band, a trombone player. And uh, he started out by just sitting in a chair with his eyes closed and just visualized the air going into his lungs and out of his lungs. And Ed is a little bit of a kind of a new age guy. So it makes sense that he approaches it this way. But I think, I thought there was, there was real value in that in itself. Even, even breaking it down to the point of just visualizing the air production going out of your body and not just picking up your horn and just figuring, oh, I'm just going to blow. Well, there's, there's a right way to blow and there's maybe not as good a way. And so I guess what we're talking about in preparation is, Do you know your body well enough to know how to get it to peak performance Mm. in as short a time as possible? And I think that's going to be different for everybody because we all have a different style and a different sound. Um, My particular way of playing trombone is a little more of kind of finesse and, 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 and subtle articulation things and things I do at the end of the notes. You know, I I mentioned I played a lot of salsa. A typical trombone salsa player plays loud and very blatty articulation. That was never really my style. What I did worked, but 
if if I'm playing the way I am, I have to get back to hearing that subtlety and getting myself prepared to do that. So I think for players, you need to kind of say, what is the outcome I'm looking for? What is my particular sound? And what is the best way for me to prepare so I can do that at the at the highest level possible? I love that. I love that. I think the big takeaway for me uh, was what do I need to do for myself personally to get to my peak performance. And that can be different for everybody. It could depend on uh, you. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses as a musician, as uh, on your instrument? And what kind of music are you trying to play? Um, you know, a lead, a lead trumpet player in a big band, for example, is going to have a, you know, a, a, a certain sort of uh, thing that he has to get to, to, to be at his peak performance. I, I was just thinking for myself really quickly, um, you know, for me, that mental side of warming up is really important. And one thing that I like to do is sometimes I like to, uh, just pick up my instrument and just slowly start playing. So I play one note, listen to the way it sounds and play another note. And then play another note, mm. and play another note, and you can call it playing free. Um, I don't like that very much because some people like think that it's I'm talking about avant garde or the style of free, you know, playing free. Right. That's not what I mean. I just mean improvising melodies. And but the point of it being that it's more about connecting your mind, your body together with your instrument kind of saying you know you know sort of that waking up in the morning and it's like yeah you're not going to go for a run right away or you're definitely going to you're going to spend a little time you're going to stretch a little bit you know you're going to loosen up you're going to think about what you got to do for the day and then maybe you can start thinking about going for a run right when your body's warmed up and your right. mind is ready for all that and that's kind of the way I like to think about getting ready to play myself um, there's been plenty of times where, you know, I've had a really busy day, uh, a lot of things going on. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh crap, I have to go to a gig. And then I go to this gig, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm there like, you know, 30 minutes ahead of time. I set up my gear. Uh, I do talk to one of the band members and then I have to start playing. Well, I'm not really mentally ready. Uh, forget about physically ready. I'm not really mentally ready. So having that ability to connect with my, with my body and my instrument, my mind, all those, those things can be very beneficial. Is that kind of what you're what you're getting at? Am I on the right track here? Yeah, a- absolutely. You know, I was going to give you an example where I'll have somebody come in uh, to do a lesson with me. And they come into the studio, they get their horn out, and they're like, okay. <laughs> and I say, Okay, I don't let let's try this. So what I do is we go outside, I take him to the side. I'm on a I'm on a mountain in 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 Phoenix and I take him out to the side where I like to blast and we do some some long tones. And it's a little bit weird because they they don't play outside perhaps and they're they're not used to kind of playing into the void, but I get him out there for about 10 minutes and we're, we're playing together and we're playing intervals to kind of hear where the pitch is and I'm getting him to play fuller and, and all of a sudden they come in back into the room, into the studio and they're surprised at how they sound. They sound bigger. They sound better. It's, it's, they're, they're, it's a little easier to play. So, you know, that kind of is, what spurred me onto this subject too, because I see it in people where they just don't think about this stuff. And if they, when they do, and it, or if they're coached to think about it, the result, they see the result is, is, is better playing. Now, is playing outside for a trombone player in this case, is, is that, can you, can you like for, for explain a little better for me? Why is it that they feel better? going back inside is it because they had to amplify themselves more outside can can you describe what that is for me a little bit yeah it, it's it's huge and 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 full disclosure i mean all through college i was the guy that was right outside the music building outside i hated going into those little rooms with the the acoustic tile <laughs> I, to this Jail day cells. i can't even yeah. play in those and i think to answer your question it's because most people brass players they're used to playing in a room Maybe a small room. Maybe they've got a bedroom. Uh, maybe they've got a little practice room in their house that's kind of sequestered off to the side. But what's happening is they're playing and they're, they're getting the instant feedback back from the walls. And 
that it's it's dramatically different when you go out and you don't have any walls and the reflections are almost non-existent. Maybe you know for me there, uh, and I and I I walk up another mountain that's a block away from me and I I play up there. I have, actually have a video on YouTube about me playing on the mountain. It the the reflections are 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 very distant. So the fact is you're, you're able to, to project without the resistance of that sound coming back at you. Mm-hmm. It's just a, a, freer, a, a freer way to project and to exercise the full extent of your, of your playing. Uh, if, it, there's a huge difference in just how my mouth feels when I'm playing outside for an hour versus when I'm playing inside for an hour. It's a, it's a huge difference. It's like... Like, you know, maybe it's the difference between kind of walking around a circle in a room and thinking that's your exercise and going outside up and down hills and uh, doing something more strenuous. Maybe that's a good analogy. Right. And something that I was thinking about while you were saying all that personally as a guitar player is, you know, sometimes I hear guitar players complain about this all the time. You go to a, a gig or a jam session, and you know you start hearing complaints about well the the sound's not right the, the the you know the room isn't good or I'm not used to playing out of this amplifier and I'm sure that bass players and piano players can relate to this too. Uh, the environment that you play in, you know, in your case, you're talking about playing outside versus playing inside, uh, can really affect the way we perceive the way we play. So if we're only comfortable playing inside of our rooms, stuck inside of our uh, space, our environment that we're used to, then maybe when we get out and you know, play in an actual performance situation, we're not going to feel comfortable. So maybe a, a little tip for for guitar players, for bass players, for, for whomever can relate to this right now is to, is to do what Michael is saying, go out into a different environment and experience something different. If you are used to practicing out of an amp, try practicing acoustic. Um, you know, that could be something Something that I imagine if we're trying to have great musical performances, we need to be warmed up and ready for any situation and truly have that connection with our instruments rather than relying on a a certain feeling or situation that we're used to. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, I, I yeah, I think a piano player who's used to playing their upright in their bedroom would be shocked at what it feels like if they could go to a concert hall and play a 9-foot Steinway oh, with yes. the, with the with the top fully open. You know, I mean, I think I think you would find uh, you might find at the end of an hour that your 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 arm and finger muscles have been worked more than you're used to them working and I think that would be a great analogy what I'm saying about outside side. Uh, I, you know, it, to show you what a nut I am about this, I'm finalizing the details of going down to Biosphere 2 down in Tucson. And they have these huge concrete donut-shaped rooms that they call the lungs, and they're made to equalize the pressure through all of Biosphere. Biosphere is a hermetically sealed environment that has deserts and lakes. It's massive hmm. for, for kind of scientific figuring out how to be self-sustaining. Well, it has a 25-second reverb in this donut-shaped concrete massive room, and I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to record some music I'm writing for that environment. Now, I guarantee you that because I'm used to playing outside, I'm going to be much more equipped to playing in there as opposed to somebody who's been playing in a, let's say, a little practice room in the college with the acoustic tiles, and then you throw them into this massive donut with 25-second reverb. Um, It's a very different experience, but it's one that I'm really looking forward to because I think I can create some very unique type of music with that, but it's going to require me to acclimate myself to a very different type of environment. By the way, I think that's really cool that you you're creating music to play specifically in a certain space. That is so awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I, I haven't really thought of that before, but that is so cool that that that's something that you actually do. I think I watched one of your YouTube videos and uh, you were like practicing in the lobby of the the hotel or something like that. It seems like that's something that you're really all about is just going out and playing. First of all, not inside of a constrained space, but uh, being in different environments is 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 that is that true about you? 
It absolutely is. And I'm going to New York in two weeks and, and I'm going to have a friend of mine where I'm going to play in the subway and we're going to film that and see what happens with that. That's a whole nother acoustic and, uh, and sociological <laughs> experience. But yeah, I am. You know, I also want to do something when I'm in New York in Washington Square Park. I used to play there when mm-hmm. I lived in uh, New York. And uh, yeah, because I lived in Boston. I went, I would put my horn on my bike uh, and I would bike up to the hat shell at late at night. And I would sit on the hat shell, on the edge of the hat shell, and play and draw a crowd. And uh, that was great fun as well. So, yes, I, you know, you're catching someone who really enjoys finding different, unique environments to play in. That's really cool. I think that's something that we can all learn from, um, especially myself, because I, I never think about doing these sorts of things. And I think that would be a wonderful thing for me just to get up out of my apartment sometime and, you know, go go sit in the park and just play a little bit, you know, and, or just, you know, try different places to play. I, I just think that's just an interesting yeah. idea in general and just kind of plays into everything we're talking about anyways. So for you, it's just this natural thing that you enjoy doing. I mean, you're, you're someone who likes to busk. I used to busk and I didn't really love doing it, but it sounds like you love busking and that's, uh, that's something that, uh, that you feed off of. Yeah, it is. That's awesome. It is. Well, you know, listen, I love I love the physical aspect of playing trombone. So going back to our topic about warming up, I, I, I feel really bad if I haven't prepared myself and now I have a gig for the next two, three hours and I'm not at my not at my peak performance. It's very important that I get my act together so that I can play well because I enjoy the physicality of the trombone. But for your listeners out there who are brass players, you know that you have good days and you have bad days. And, you know, you can't always predict when all of the muscles are going to align like the stars. So, you know, this whole topic about warming up is getting us as close as we can to making, you know, as many of those days as as possible where the stars do line. Absolutely. That makes total sense. Okay, I'm going to put you on the hot seat really quickly here, Michael. Uh, Okay. uh, What if, because, you know, we talked about how, you know, my video about 30, 30 minute practice session. And I've actually done on this podcast, a, a maintenance practice session. It was literally, it was literally a, a morning I was, I was waking up to, and I was going to, it was podcast recording day. And I was like, man, I have not been able to practice very much, way too much stuff going on. I have a gig tonight. What am I going to do? I'm going to maintenance practice on the podcast. And I did that. But, but, you know, again, as a guitar player, it's a little different what I need to do. It's, it was very similar to the 30 minute practice session video you're referring to. But what if you're a, a horn player? What if you are a, a brass player like yourself and here's the deal. You, you just you have a, you have a performance coming up, a jam session, gig, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But you don't have you don't have any time. What would you tell those people to do at the very minimum to get themselves ready for the best performance they can possibly have under those conditions? Okay. Well, what I would say first of all is we all have time. The question is how are we investing the time? So, for instance, um, if I'm pushed to the point where I literally have no choice to, and I can't practice that day, I'm going to be buzzing my mouthpiece on the ride to the gig. Ah, okay. I'm going to be holding a pencil. I'm going to be holding a pencil in the tip of my lips to make to get these muscles around. I'm going to be doing some deep breathing, not hyperventilating while I drive, hopefully, but I'm going to be <laughs> doing some deep breathing. So I know some things away from the horn that I can do that'll at least get me to the point where it's not completely cold when I show up. But today is an example for me. I've got a big gig tonight with Lewis Nash, and Ooh. I've got to be in peak performance for that. So, so, And I've got a busy day, but what am I going to do? I'm going to take moments, and maybe they're three, four-minute moments. I'm going to pick up the horn. I'm going to play some long tones. I'm going to go outside. I'm going to play long tones. I'm going to articulate a little bit, put the horn back, work. I'm going to find another five minutes. And if I do that throughout the day, that will be huge and probably a lot better than if I, if I had an hour before the gig to warm up. I find that doing something throughout the day in little spurts is very beneficial for me, and that's how I'm going to handle today. Great. That's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. That's I think it's going to be helpful for a lot of people listening who are in that situation. So, Michael, what? how would you sum this up? What do you really want people to know based on what we've talked about today? What do you want people to really take away from this episode today about warming up uh, their body and mind? 
Well, and, and I think what I would do to answer your question is just touch a little bit on the other aspect. We've been talking a lot about the physicality of playing an instrument, but I also think there is another aspect to it, which is, which is being being prepared in terms of now this is not as much a guitar thing as a as a horn player or a brass player but intonation and getting your intonation warmed up or getting your ear warmed up so part of what i want to do today is i may throw out a little band in the box uh, maybe find one of your backing tracks <laughs> and just play tones through them to to align my sense of harmony and sense of frequencies with changes and 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 that is it, probably as important for going and playing a gig tonight where I'm going to be improvising for two or three hours as it is the physical part of it. Because speaking for myself, if I just pick up the horn, even if I'm warmed up and I show up and I and, and you're playing changes, Brent, I'm not going to be at my best unless I've taken a little bit of time before that and kind of tuned myself to the frequencies and the pitches and just getting my ear, not just because I play trombone and we have to find the pitches, but but to know, to have that instinct. So when I hear D7, my instincts take me to the right places. So that's a, I think that's a very important thing that people overlook. And again, it's take the horn out, da 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 okay, I'm ready to blast. Well, maybe not. Maybe if you take a little bit more time and play some long tones through some chord changes, and and Brent, you've talked a lot about band in the box, and it's an incredible uh, tool to use for this. Just to have some changes at the ready that aren't hard, but that you're listening to your pitch as you play through the changes, and and you're not trying to blow anybody away with what you're playing. It's just aligning your your instincts to your ear, and I think that's a big part of preparation for jazz players. Yeah, for I- any instrument. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love that. I love the, 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 this sort of aural context here in preparing yourself that way, which is actually an answer, a further answer to the question I asked before about what can you do if you don't have a lot of time. There's those things that you can do, and there's a lot of things that you can do to just start getting your, your brain thinking musically and hearing things musically and all that stuff. So that's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Michael, I, I want to thank you so much for sharing all this today. This is very valuable stuff. Um, I know that there's some things that you've said today that I haven't thought about before that I'm going to be chewing on. So I thank you for uh, just sharing your expertise with the audience today, just laying it all down. And uh, this has been a great episode. Um, I want people to know more about you in case they don't. Where can people find more about you, learn more about you, get more out of what you are and what you do? Sure. Well, my home site is altobone.com, and uh, that's where you can see my store of books and music and compositions and ebooks. And you were very generous in promoting my ebook uh, on your podcast with Rodney that you mentioned earlier, my ebook called The Brain Friendly Method for Musical Excellence. Uh, that's been <laughs> getting that. some nice sales since you're mentioned, so I appreciate that. It's basically a, an ebook that shows musicians how to get the most from their brain to be the best musician they can. I would suggest people go to YouTube. I have a lot of videos on some very unique ways to approach, as you kind of heard through this podcast, to approach improvisation and uh, some things you probably haven't thought about. And I'm very practical in terms of how I teach this. So uh, I go to great lengths to show things on the screen and give you playing examples and talk about stuff and make it entertaining in the process. So I think between my site and YouTube, those are the two best places to go to uh, to uh, get some insight into what I'm uh, cooking up here. And by the way, Brent, anytime you want to come out to my mountain and blast with me, you're welcome. <laughs> I, I, I would I would love to do that. I would love to come out to Arizona. That sounds like a, a nice little retreat. So thank, thanks for offering. So altobone.com and also look Michael up on YouTube. Well, Michael, thank you again for being on the show. Appreciate you. And uh, I'm sure that we're going to have you uh, on the show sometime again in the future. My pleasure, Brent. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right, that's all for today's show. Big thanks again to our special guest, Michael Lake, for sharing all of his knowledge. Uh, I know I got a lot out of that. I'm sure that you did 
too. So big thanks to him. And hey, I ask that at the end of every single episode. If you got value out of this podcast episode or any of the other episodes that I come out with, please go to iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts and leave a five-star rating review. Just let other people know why you like this podcast. Just helps other people know this is a podcast worth listening to. So thanks for taking the time to do that. And of course, like I said, I want you to be subscribed to the show because we got some great stuff coming out. We have a great episode coming out next week. And then after that, we're starting Jazz Standards Month, where we're going to be celebrating Jazz Standards figuring out how to learn them better, how to understand them better, how to improvise over them better. We're going to be focusing the entire month of May on that. Also, I'm going to be coming out with my uh, new ebook and companion course. Me and the team have been working incredibly hard on it uh, at the end of May. That's the Jazz Standards Playbook Volume 2. So you're going to want to be involved in all of that. So stay subscribed. I appreciate you. Thanks for being a listener. I don't take it for granted. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks for listening to the LJS Podcast, brought to you by LearnJazzStandards.com. Subscribe to the series on iTunes, and don't forget to join our jazz community at LearnJazzStandards.com forward slash newsletter.